everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Happy New Year and happy Kwanzaa, happy final day of Kwanzaa. I'm here today with my co-host for this event, Mr. Ben Guillory, the co-founder of the Roby Theater Company. Hi, Ben. Hey, Melina. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Happy New Year. Yes, happy New Year and happy final day of Kwanzaa. Yes. It's the final day of Kwanzaa. You know, we've been celebrating Kwanzaa since the 26th of December. That's for those of you who might not know all of this. It's seven days. It begins on the day after Christmas. And uh, Roby's been celebrating that with some of you, our constituency and our audience. And welcome, welcome. Glad you could make it. And I hope your uh, holidays are good, real good. And it's because it's going to be a good year. I mean, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. I won't go into all of the depth of what we've been going through because everybody knows, but it's looking better. It's looking very promising. So what we've got here tonight is part of the, what we've entitled the Developing Community Creative Voices Program. And this is a direct and concentrated effort to involve our community in the creative process from the page to the stage. We've invited playwrights to submit plays having to do with Kwanzaa that will be developed over the year uh, 2021 and land hopefully by the holiday season, November, December, so that we may produce this play with a Kwanzaa theme. Now that has, of course, all of us will, I think, agree that probably by then, given the vaccine, given time, we will be able to go back into the theater as we had and sit and watch a play. And that's the hope and probably, I think we will be able to do that. That's a year away now. So uh, it's uh, again, promising. These seven scenes that we'll read tonight from seven different playwrights are have to do with the Kwanzaa theme. Uh, we have some talented and gifted playwrights and we wanted you, again, our constituency and artist community to take part in this and see what we, what's been submitted and to offer your opinions as uh, Melina had mentioned. So we're gonna do that. The names of the playwrights will remain anonymous, except for what uh, Crystal had mentioned earlier. We're not connecting them to the play because we want that to be anonymous, the plays to be judged on their content and their content only. So uh, we've gathered a group, a company of actors that have recorded each and every scene. We'll present those to you with the synopsis so you have a frame of reference for each scene. And, and that's it. And then we'll have a conversation afterwards. I think I've covered everything, haven't I, Melina? Have I? Yes, you have covered just, you've actually covered everything. And right before we jump into the scenes, just in recognizing our final day of Kwanzaa, we're going to symbolically light the final candle, our red candle for our final day of Kwanzaa. And another tradition that is usual, that usually happens on the final day, in addition to lighting the candle, is gifts are given. Now, for Kwanzaa, it's not about you know going to Saks or Macy's or any a store. It's more about homemade gifts, gifts from the heart that generally mean something. And so, here on behalf of the Roby Theater Company, this is our gift from the heart to you. And right now, we're going to symbolically light the final candle. Imani, Faith, the final candle, the final day of Kwanzaa. Happy 2021, everyone. Happy 2021, everyone. Happy mm. 2021, everyone. Thank you, Adia. She's on our Ruby content committee who helped bring this to you this evening as part of our virtual Kwanzaa celebration. And again, one more time, I'll say it then out, the final thing is our gift to you is the gift of the talents of the participants who are the members of the Roby Theater Company. And the gift of giving you the talent 
display that you will see in these following seven scenes. So we're gonna jump right into all of the action and all of the fun. I will say one thing right before we get started, please remember that we are a community theater company and we need support. We appreciate your support. Thank you for watching us. And please, when you are able to, please go to the website, click donate and any donation that you're able to give to us is a tax write-off, tax deductible. Um, as we are a nonprofit. So there's that. But we're going to jump right on into these scenes because I know everyone is excited as I am. I know, Ben, you're excited. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So the first one is called Habari. Okay, what? So this is a story about a couple whose family member comes to visit at Christmas. Now, while they don't lose sight of Christmas, they deepen who they are as a Black people with a renewed understanding of themselves and the world around them through celebrating the seven principles of Kwanzaa during this family member's visit. The hope is that this couple will grasp onto these newfound principles and incorporate them more into their daily lives as Kwanzaa is not to be celebrated just at Christmas, but all year. Here is Habari K. What? He's going to get there. Oh, this is going to be a good one. You know, just the title in and of itself. You know, we were talking about the titles, Ben, that Habari, Kate, what? What? It's, it's, you know, I learned a lot about Kwanzaa just as we put this together. I know you, you did as well, Ben, right? Yes, Habari is a greeting. That's part of the greeting of, of uh, Kwanzaa. And mm -hmm. as, as you said, this is about a family that doesn't know much about it. So the idea of Habari K, which of course, Kwanzaa, what? The play, Habari K what? At Rise, a modern contemporary stylish home with bare basics of what is needed. The living room is stylishly decorated with Christmas essentials, but not overly done. The house is warm and inviting with the throwback pictures of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that adorn seen but not seen places on the walls. Soulful old school Christmas music from various Motown and contemporary artists can be heard, making the house festive. Ray is sitting in a high back chair with highball in hand, singing, swinging to the music as his wife, Robin, is lounging on the sofa. After a few moments, the record changes, and Robin and Ray get up to dance. Woo! Oh, girl. <laughs> Come on now. Shake that thing. <laughs> Woo! Meet me on the turnaround, Big Daddy. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> Doorbell rings. Uh, Robin woo. answers the door and greets her cousin, Cliff. Well. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? Come on in here. Ray, look who's at the door. <laughs> Man, get your ass in here. Come in here and make yourself at home. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. It sure is great to see everybody. So glad you could make it. I was just asking about you, man. It is great to see you. It's great to be seen. I know that's right. Just drop your bags right there and come in here and relax. <laughs> Buzz, let me take your coat for you and just find yourself a seat. Oh, Cliff, look at here. Man, you always represent. What that you got on? Babe, he's wearing a dashiki. Ooh, is that right? A dashiki? <laughs> don't pay him no mind. Ray, you are not that far removed from the 1960s, 70s either. It's just that I'd never seen one like this before. Looks like a real deal. Look like your front, the fabric and, uh, and the design. Is it from Africa? Yes, it is from the motherland. Uh, this, this particular tunic is one of my favorites. Cliff, you are really into the culture. <laughs> hey, Cliff will tell you the most important thing is our culture. It's all about black pride. Hmm. 
So is this about uh, ancient Africa? No, man. <laughs> they did not have dashikis in ancient Africa. This dashikis are more African contemporary wear, traditionally worn by men in West Africa to deal with the heat. And they're commonly worn under large robes. Some of the garments were found in the sacred burial caves in Southern Mali, which date back to the 12th and 13th centuries. But, but here in America, dashikis became the symbol of Pan-Africanism and the Black resistance in terms of politics. Wow. Man, you just dropped pearls, but that whole damn ocean. Crazy. <laughs> you are crazy. Babe, think 1960s and 1970s. Mm. Think about Stokely Carmichael, where he sometimes wore dashiki along with the Black Panthers. And don't forget those who were in the civil rights and black power movements who also wore them. Speaking of the 60s and 70s, the house decorations you have remind me of when I was growing up. Yeah, there's nothing like a little nostalgia and some long practice traditions to make you think of family. Mm -hmm. Big mama would have the house all laid out. Every nook and cranny would have something representing Christmas. Tell me about it. Y'all got a nice place here. Robin, it is also beautifully decorated. Why, thank you, cuz. I just didn't want to go overboard, cuz sometimes a little means a lot. Man, don't let her fool you. She's about to blow this place up with Christmas stuff. Now, I reminded her what goes up must go down. <laughs> Wasn't that a song? Why, yes, it was. Tyrone Davis back in the 70s. Oh. So Ray, you can remember Tyrone Davis, but you can't remember folks wearing dashikis. Miss me on that one. Ain't that the truth? Woman, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't studying you. Man, let me get you a drink. I'm good for now, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good. I'm just looking around. Did I miss something? I tried to decorate the house with all your favorite things. Mm. The house looks great, but it is missing something. Really? Well, I have Big Mama's- uh, no, The Christmas decorations are fine, but we need, what we need is some holiday Afrocentric decor. No disrespect to Malcolm X and Martin hanging over there in the wings. See, that's why you are wearing that dashiki. Not quite, but almost. Mm -hmm. But we are missing dear cousin is Kwanzaa. Where is your Kwanzaa stuff at? Kwan who? Kwan? K what? The man said Kwanzaa. Ah, Kwan whatever. Is it some kind of black power movement? Don't tell me y'all never heard of Kwanzaa before. I heard about it, Cliff. Just never really celebrated it. Man, is this Christmas? This is Christmas. Are you saying Christmas is over? No, I'm not. Cliff, have you stopped celebrating Christmas? I know at one time you were thinking it was too commercialized. Mm. Is this the one of those Gills got hair moments? Because I know we are still waiting for the revolution to be televised. And I ain't never got my 40 acres and mule either. Hey. <laughs> Ray, go stick your drunk ass down somewhere. <laughs> Not drunk yet, <laughs> but I do have a question. So when does uh, Quan? Hold on, hold, on. <laughs> hold up. Uh, I got it. Uh, Kwanzaa start. I'm glad you asked. Today is the first day of Kwanzaa. Okay, well, uh, happy Kwanzaa. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> But there is a bit more to it than that. Man, you lie. Ray, Ray, no more eggnog for you. I'm good, babe, I'm good, really. I'm, I'm good. sorry, Cliff. Cliff, my man, how long is Kwanzaa? Because we still got some Christmas ham and, and ain't nothing gonna keep me from making my ham sandwich, if you know what I mean. Kwanzaa is usually a few days, Ray, if I remember right. Kwanzaa is a week. It starts the day after Christmas and goes to New Year's Day. I know that this is not going to interfere with my black eyed peas and greens on New Year's Day, is it? Otherwise, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we just gonna go back to Africa for a whole week and forget about Christmas. 
Ray, don't be silly. Ray, Kwanzaa adds to Christmas. Mm. Just as Christmas is important as a religious observance of the birth of our Lord and Savior, we, as a race of people, need to be reminded that we as Black people are just as important too, and we can't forget our roots. This is a celebration of our identity, purpose, and direction. That's why we have Black History Month. Touche. But one month could never celebrate all the accomplishments of our people, especially since Black people built America. Mm. Now you speak in my language. <laughs> can we get back to Kwanzaa, please? Yes, we can. Kwanzaa means first fruits in Swahili, and there are seven main principles that we focus on. We highlight one principle and light a candle for that principle each day. Hmm. So if Kwanzaa starts today, is that why you came dressed up in your cool dashiki to set off the occasion? Being with family is always an occasion. Hmm. I see you, man. I see you. <laughs> now that we had another male bonding moment, <laughs> are we going to do this today? Pass me that big rat box over there with the red bow on top after you open it. Mm. Robin finds the box, opens it, and passes it to her cousin Cliff. Wow. I was thinking you brought a Christmas present, but it looks like we got a Kwanzaa in a box. This is great. Let's put everything here on the coffee table. Man, you're killing me. You always on point. Always on point. <laughs> I need a drink. See them seven and seven, anyone? Cliff carefully huh? takes all of the Kwanzaa items out of the box and explains everything as he sets up the coffee. We have a woven mat, which we put down first. Next is the Kanara, which is the symbol of our roots with the seven candles, with three red, three green, and one black candle goes in the center and we light it first. The unity cup, which we drink libations from to give thanks to our ancestors. Here is some beautiful kente cloth and African statues for your table and I just need some fruits and vegetables to put on the side. Symbolize crops, or better known as the African harvest. If you had kids, we place an ear of corn for each child. One last thing is the red, black, and green flag. Do we need to hang the flag? Well, you could if you wanted to over there. I'm sure Malcolm and Martin would not mind or we can drape it right here on the front of the table now there's just one last thing which is the kwanzaa greeting and the response is that swahili too you are correct my man is everyone ready 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 oh wait i forgot to give you the other rap box this is for the two of you Oh, man. Ray and Robin tear off the wrapping of the second box. Inside the box, they find two beautifully custom-made his and hers dashikis. Liv, this is beautiful. Look at here. <laughs> I'm as fly as you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. Ray, stop talking and let's slip these on. <laughs> now. Now we're all dressed in our African attire. Let me greet you. Habari Ghani. Habari Ghani. Does this meaning, uh, this greeting have a meaning or do we give a response? Yes. Um, so when I say Habari Ghani, it means how are you? And your response or answer to me is Umoja, which means unity from the first principle of the day. Mm. Today, we look at unity in our family and community and our people as we light the black candle to represent that. Ray, please do the honors. Ray lights the black candle in the canary. Unity. 
Let's start at home with family. We all need to work on strengthening and unifying some of our relationships at home so we can better help those outside of the family. Well, we've seen unity in our communities with the marches for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the whole Black Lives Matter movement. It is good to see new blood taking up the cause and not being afraid of the struggle. Yes. It's sad to see the chant, no justice, no peace is still relevant four years later after I was marching down Georgia Avenue from Howard University to the Washington Monument while my friends from UC Berkeley and UC Davis, though small in number, joined with me. Thank you, Cliff, for reminding me and Ray that no matter how far we have come, yeah. there's still a road where we need to go and we need to practice being unified every day. Every day. What's tomorrow's principle? Kuji Chakulila, which means self-determination as we define and name ourselves. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't know about y'all, but it's time for me to unify with another single seven and seven and a ham sandwich. <laughs> Y'all welcome to join me. <laughs> Habari Gani. Umoja. Umoja. That was pretty awesome. I, I learned a lot. I like Habari Kate. What? <laughs> that title is pretty cool. That sums it up, right? Does sum it up in quite an education, yes. Say that again. I said a quite an education too. Yeah, yeah. You really, you know, it's it's I've gotten so much out of this entire out of the event that we had on December 11th, and now out of the the what we're learning through the plays. And speaking of that, let's get right into the next one. Mm -hmm. It's titled You Will See Me. Keep in mind, folks, well, you can't help but keep in mind, but you have to plug in your imagination in a lot of this, since there are no production values, it's a reading. There's a lot of blanks that you need to fill in. So keep an open mind about this and fill in those blanks whenever possible, please. If you want to be seen, sometimes you have to make someone see you. At the age of 23, Jonathan Mills has finally turned the post-traumatic corner of living out of a car with his drug-addicted mother and not knowing his father for most of his life. Jonathan has established his own cultural identity and rejects the notion of being referred to as an African-American. He is a nigger, nothing more, nothing less. Armed with this self-realization, he pays what he considers a final trip to his father's house in the hopes of bringing his manhood full circle and reconcile their differences. At what happens to be the first day of Kwanzaa, an African-American celebration created by uh, Dr. Koenga, Jonathan's older sister, Alexis, two younger brothers, Brian and Mark, and a stepmother, Debbie, don't know what to make of his visit. It is resolved that Jonathan will join them for Kwanzaa until his father, Wesley, demands an apology. The prologue. Lights up, Jonathan is sitting on a wooden chair under a spotlight. He speaks directly to the audience. My name is Jonathan and I'm not black. I mean, I'm black, but not the kind of black you think I am or say that you know I am or that you think I should be. No disrespect to anybody, but I don't dance. I don't put lotion on my skin, grease in my hair. I don't like sweet potato pie, banana pudding, collard greens, stuffing, excuse me, dressing. I actually like pumpkin pie and apple pie. I don't rap, but I do like Drake, he cool. I didn't vote for Biden, so I guess according to him, I'm really not black. Look, my father wasn't in my life until I was eight. I got a little PTSD from sleeping in my mama's car every night, waking up, 
going to school, pretending like I showered, which I don't think I ever showered. My father didn't accept that I was his because it would have demoted him to a broke ass black man who fathered a child out of wedlock with a crackhead. If he had just looked into my eyes, he would have seen himself in me and maybe he would have said he is mine, but he didn't, still hasn't. And even when he was pressured to move me in his house, because yes, my mom was strung out and yes, the school did threaten to send me to foster care, he still never said you are mine. Eight long years, my mama would take me to his house every day, knock on his door and say, Wesley, this is your son, Jonathan Wesley. That's how I met my stepmother, Debbie, my older sister, Alexis, my two younger brothers, Brian and Mark. You can imagine the elephant in that room. <laughs> I was black then, I was the black sheep. I didn't have nice clothes, I had holes in my shoes. I mean, if somebody I slept with told me I had a son, First thing I would do is look in his eyes. And if I saw myself, I would say, he is mine. I would hold him in my arms. I would kiss my lady on the cheek. I would pay the bills. I would watch TV with the kids, hang out with my dudes every once in a while, but family would always come first. I would build things, fix things, read, write, speak eloquently. All my dudes would be like, dude, you smart as shit. And all my ladies would be like, you an educated black man. And I would just scratch my head with my left hand and say, eh, sorry, ladies, I'm taken. I wouldn't feel like I needed to follow any legacies except for by my ancestors that were chained and whipped and forced to take English names, but stayed strong all the same. I would get a degree in every subject possibly could and dare you to test my brain. If I were black, I would fight against discrimination for equality for my people. I would gladly smile and say, yes, sir. No, ma'am, please, thank you. Ha <laughs> ha, that's so funny. I would respond to African drums calling me and pour libations in honor of the spirits, burn sage, move in slow motion, channel my inner spiritual psyche. <laughs> Just like you do. Oh, you don't do that? No, no sage, no incense? It's cool. It's a lot to be black. I don't have a bunch of degrees. I barely finished high school, but that was enough for me. I don't have any kids, but I live with my girl Sylvia and her son Angel in a one bedroom apartment. He ain't mine, but I love him like he is because I don't want him growing up thinking that he don't belong anywhere. That's my Mexican. Not really. He's Mexican and he's mine because I see myself in him. You see, I ain't what you think I am. For 23 years, I've had to figure out how to hold a job, keep a relationship, raise a child. I don't write books, sing songs, dance, run, play basketball. I don't do any of that shit, but I'm cool with it. I'm finally cool with just being me. I haven't talked to my father in five years since he kicked me out of the house saying, if you don't want to follow in my rules, then get the fuck out of my house. I never knew there were rules. I sacrificed too much in my life trying to get him to love me. And I swear to God, I'm gonna give it one last try, but the only person I can be is me. And I'm not black, I'm a nigga. Scene one, the Hanson household on the first day after Christmas. There's a tree in the corner and an array of Kwanzaa candles on the center table. Christmas paper wrappings are scattered on the floor. Brian is sitting in front of the TV with headphones on his head playing a video game, Grand Theft Auto. Alexis is in the kitchen texting on her phone. I'll get it. She opens it. Hey. Hey. Alexis. Who is it? Hey, Debbie. I had the day off, so I thought it would stop by. Can I come in? Um, yes, of course. So, how have you been? Where have you been? I mean, it's good to see you. I've been good, you know, just living. I got a job. I live with my girl and her son. Not too far from here, city over. 
Jonathan sees a dirty plate on the floor and immediately picks it up, looking for the trash. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. Let me get it. It's cool. I got it, you know. Still me, cleaning up after everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jonathan. You always did like to clean up. Alexis points to the corner. Jonathan goes to the trash in the corner. Brian realizes he is there and takes off his headphones. Brian, it's your brother, Jonathan. Say hello. Hey, man. Hey, man, what's up? Brian gets up, they embrace friendly. Brian picks up his game and goes back to his bedroom. We hear. Hey, 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 hey. Mom, mom, mom. Brian is being rude again. He kicked me off the game and he told me to get out. Oh. Is that? Yes, it is. Does dad know he's here? Nope, I don't think so. Should I call dad? Uh, hey, we can all hear you. Hey, Brian. Wow, <laughs> you've grown taller in five years. Yeah. Jonathan approaches him and they hug awkwardly. So, how long are you staying? Uh, where are you? Well, well, I was hoping me and my girl and her son could move back in here, be a family. <laughs> I'm kidding, I just thought I would stop by holidays and all. Yeah, we haven't done much. You know, times are hard and money is low. Brian emerges from the room counting dollar bills. Brian, where'd you get that money from? I found it. Where? On the floor, next to my bed. That's my money. But I found it. Well, technically, if you found it on the floor next to your bed, it was next to my bed since my bed is across from yours. And if it was on my side of the room on my bed, I don't know how it could have ended up on the floor. You spent all your money. Brian bolts out of the room. Mark follows. Oh, God, no! Brian! Ugh, those boys. I'm so tired of them always fighting over money. Their dad gave them both $200 for Christmas and they still fight. Debbie would leave without saying anything, realizing what she had just said. So what's with the candles? Well, I wanted to try something different this year, Kwanzaa. It's an African-American celebration about family and coming together as a community. Oh, yeah, I think I heard of that. Black people reminding themselves that they are Black. African-American. Oh, so you all became African-American since I've been gone, huh? Well, I think we've always been Africans in America, so why not? I don't know. I'm just playing on... Never mind. Say it. No, I ain't going to say it just because you want me to say it. I'm going to say it when I want to. Uh-huh. You can stay if you want. Today is the first day. We celebrate unity. Well, you think dad will mind? Look, look, I don't want to come here and cause trouble. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. I just... Hey, it's no problem. You can stay as long as you like. What? No. I mean, what? What's going on? Jonathan is going to join us for Kwanzaa. How long did you say this Kwanzaa thing is? Seven days. But you're welcome to stay, or rather, you're welcome to leave and come back each day if you like. What about that? Yes. What about that? I mean, Wesley, your father. Let me worry about him. Wesley stumbles through the floor with gifts. Uh, 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 Brian, Mark, come help me with a few things. Wesley almost drops something and John Ooh. catches it. Oh, thank you. Wait, what are you doing here? Just, uh, just dropping by to say hello. Hello. <laughs> and he is going to join us for Kwanzaa. Like hell he is. You still owe me an apology. An apology for what? 
you the one who told me to get the fuck out of your house. Young man, don't use that language in this house. What? You said it. What do you need? Money? You lose your job? I don't need your money. I got a job, a good one. You need a place to stay? You probably got kicked out of your place. I don't need anything from you. Your mother put you up to this? I wish you would stop bringing my mother into this. You know, that's a great segue into the first day of Kwanzaa, unity. I'm going to light the first candle. No, you're not gonna light no candles in this house. He needs to go. Jonathan starts to leave, then stops and turns and I'm saying right here, you're gonna see me. And this time, I'm not going anywhere until you see yourself in me. Alexis lights a candle. We fade to black. Wow, yeah. powerful stuff. He said yeah. he wasn't going anywhere. Strong, strong, strong. Yeah, yeah. We welcome your comments. Please put your comments in the chat. Um, we're gonna have a brief discussion afterwards, but if you have something to say, we do have someone monitoring the chat, so please feel free to, to put it in there. Thank you, Yolanda Franklin, appreciate that. So we're gonna go on to our third play, and this one takes place, it's an untitled Kwanzaa play. This is play number three. Um, so you, as long as you're counting and keeping number, keeping track, we'll be able to know. Um, so the time period is December 25th, 1971, and the place is the home of Pastor Solomon Williams Sr. Now the play opens with JR standing outside the front door of his home, bags in hand, practicing his lines to tell the family he's changed his major to Pan-African Studies. Now it was always thought that JR would take the role as assistant pastor of his father's church. Edna and Claudette have awaited JR's arrival all day. JR makes an attempt to introduce the Kwanzaa celebration to his family, but is met by resistance by the women of the household and anger and rejection by his father who forbids the celebration in his home. After dinner at the Williams household, JR is helping his mother, Claudette and grandmother Edna clear the dinner dishes. JR, how many units do you have left to finish your degree? Mm, unfortunately, there have been some changes in the department and I may have to stay another semester. Really? How are you going to pay for it? You know your dad is expecting you to graduate this June. I don't know if he'll be willing to pay for another semester's tuition. He doesn't have a choice. If JR is going to be, become an associate pastor to his father, he needs that degree. <laughs> he'll pay for it all right. Well, what classes do you still need? I don't remember without looking at the paperwork they sent me. Um, it's okay if he doesn't want to pay. You know, the Lord will make a way somehow, right, Grandma? <laughs> yes, son, he surely will. I remember back when me and your grandpa didn't have any money and got put out of that little bedroom, that one bedroom house we were renting. <laughs> uh, uh, here we go. Why would you have to get her started? Go home and tell the story, Grandma. Testify. There was a lady I was sweeping in front of her house. <laughs> the Lord told us to go talk to her. We we asked her if, if she had any rooms for rent, and she said no. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Stop playing. I'm trying to tell a story here. <laughs> but anyway, the lady looked us up and down. She, she got real quiet. <laughs> then she said, y'all look like good people. If you need a room, I'll let you stay in the basement. <laughs> Frank told her we would, we didn't have any money, but he was looking for work. And that lady took us right on the spot. See, the Lord, Lord will make will a make way, a way, a way of so <laughs> <laughs> At the table, the table is cleared and JR goes to the room to get his items for Kwanzaa celebration. He brings them to the table where the ladies are sitting. What's all that, son? It's for the Kwanzaa celebration. You've heard of Kwanzaa, right? No, what is that? That's something by that Ron Karenga guy to replace Christmas, isn't it? Replace Christmas? 
Nothing can replace the birth of Jesus now. No, Grandma, it, it doesn't replace it at all. Look, let me set things up and I'll explain. I don't know about all this, but I'll listen. It's good to know what the devil's up to. Yeah, look, it's, it's all very symbolic. This is the Nkika. He holds up a straw mat. It symbolizes tradition on which everything else rests. It symbolizes tradition on which everything else rests. You agree that tradition is important, don't you? Yes, of course we do. In this family, we have a tradition of ministers, your grandfather, your father, and soon to be you. We have the tradition of family eating their meals together. You know, that's going out of style. Everybody wants to do their own thing in dinner time. <laughs> I believe that if you don't eat any other meal together, you should eat dinner as a family. That way you can get to catch up on the day's activities, see what the, see where the devil is lurking. Yeah, right, Grandma. Then there's the most important, the Kanara. Looks like one of those those Jewish celebration candles to me. Hanukkah, Edna. But that's <laughs> not a menorah because it doesn't have enough candles. You're right, Mom. It only has seven candles. Each day of the celebration, we light one of them. The celebration lasts seven days. It starts tomorrow and lasts until January 1st. Oh, that sounds nice. But I don't know if your father's going to go for it. For one thing, it's too close to Christmas. Then... I read about that Karanga dude. He's very violent and like a black activist trying to overthrow the country. I don't think he believes in God. He's trying to push those African religions on us. <laughs> I'm not African. Mm -mm, I'm, a, I'm an American. My ancestors built America with their blood and sweat. And I'm not going back to Africa. How you, how you gonna go back to somewhere you ain't been in the first place? Nobody is trying to send anybody anywhere. It's just a celebration to remind us of our African roots. Well, you can celebrate all you want, but don't expect your father to go along with it. If he can't find God in it, it ain't happening. As they complete putting the candles in the Kanara, Pastor Solomon enters the room. What are you guys in here discussing? I hope you have the solution to the world problems. I'm not talking about nothing. I'm going in the kitchen to put the food away. <laughs> the solution to the world problems is simple, love. Yep, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. At least that's what Dion Warwick says. And a good homemade sweet potato pie. So what's this candle set up here? I see red, black, and green. What's this about? JR, explain it to your dad like you did to us. It's a cultural celebration. Go ahead, son. Tell him about it. Uh, well, dad, this is for the Kwanzaa celebration. Mm -hmm. Starting tomorrow, we will light a candle for each of the principles of Kwanzaa. I see seven candles. Seven is a good number. It in the Bible, it represents completion and perfection. You know that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. Jacob worked seven years before he could marry Rachel. In the book of Revelation, there are seven candlesticks and seven stars. Hmm. Uh, so why are there seven candles? Well, like you said, because there are seven days in a week. But dad, that's not what Kwanzaa is about. It's, it's about connecting with our African roots. See, the word is Swahili and it means first fruits of the harvest. That is something our people know about, harvesting. We harvested cotton, we harvested tobacco, we harvested sugar, we even harvested rice. See, most people think rice was only grown in China, but the slaves here in America harvested rice. It was very hard work. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry. What were you saying? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Maulana Ron Karenga adopted some of the customs from Africa to create Kwanzaa. What did you just say? Ron Karenga? You're following him? 
that guy is a dissident. He's anti-American. Hell, he's a criminal. I, I don't want you having to do anything to do with him or, or his Kwanzaa. But that you, you don't understand. You, you, you have to open your mind to new things. Let me tell you something, son. The only thing you have to open your mind to is completing your philosophy degree so you can go to seminary. Whatever Ron Karing and his group does is none of your concern and it won't be brought in this house. The word of God says in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is my household. I am the head. End of discussion. Grandma Edna emerges from the kitchen with three plates of sweet potato pie. I think what everyone needs is a nice slice of pie to calm their nerves. <laughs> Solomon, mm. I know it will make you feel better. <laughs> I'll get some ice cream to go on top. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mother. I'll take mine in the study. And the lights go down. All right, now that was play number three. So again, we do welcome your comments and we appreciate your comments as this is a work in progress. We're working this out together. So how you doing over there, Ben? Everything okay? Yeah, you know, the work, it's always just fascinating, uh, the playwright's progress and how it reveals itself. Uh, you know, these are first shots, first drafts of a scene of a play that hasn't been written yet. That is basically an idea. And each playwright has expounded on that idea and fashioned uh, a, a world that may or well certainly will develop uh, more as it goes along and to just get a sense and see what each playwright is doing I'm, I've always found that part of the creative process just fascinating because you know our audience all of us when we go to a play we see the finished product we see it in its pristine state so to speak you know in almost, if one could use the word, perfect state. But we don't see the many, many, many steps that it takes to get from the page to the stage. And it's hard work. It's hard work. Yes. And Very I, salute, I salute this part of the genesis of the creative process for the theater is the playwright, you know. It's fascinating stuff. Yes, absolutely. And we're getting some great comments. And, you know, some people have already said it made them laugh out loud. And mm. so I hope the playwrights are, are watching and that they're taking these comments into consideration and just sitting back and enjoying the response. Yeah. Yeah. So that takes us to our fifth, uh, no, oh, pardon me, our fourth one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And gonna throw that one to you, Ben. A celebration of unity, a Kwanzaa story. When a passionate American history teacher is stranded in a hotel room in Africa because of the outbreak of COVID-19, he conducts his virtual classroom using Zoom. Dr. Agu has a thirst to expand about his knowledge about his ancestry and plans to share his experiences and the origins of Kwanzaa. His young college students are not ready for the lesson and principles of Kwanzaa. Dr. Agu thinks the young people are progressive, but he is in for an eye-opening surprise. In the middle of the day, two of his classes, the pandemic is rampant in African township and causes disruptions. Can't you hear me? What, what are you? What about the world? No, I I haven't been listening about world news. I told you I wanted to, to be off of the grid, Ma. Off the grid? 
who are you, Grizzly Adams? We don't go off the grid. Anyway, the world is under attack by COVID-19 and people are dying everywhere. Well, who's, who's dying, Mom? What about, co well, what did you say? Uh, under attack? I, I, I will be on the next flight out of here. People are dying. I don't know them, son. It's COVID-19, a terrifying disease. You are not going anywhere. The borders are shut down. Turn on the news now, baby boy. You might be safe for staying in Ghana for a while. I, I am worried, Mom. You and Papa are okay, right? I, I'm supposed to be back on campus on Wednesday to teach my history class. I really wanted to share my adventures in Africa and talk about Kwanzaa, but how can I do that now? Bad news. All the classes are virtual. But don't worry. I called the university and told them that you would conduct your classes online. Get ready, son. I know you can do it. Now, get back on the grid. Zoom? Hello? Hello? Mom? What has she done now? <laughs> Dr. Agu sits at his laptop to prepare for his first Zoom meeting with his students in California. He has on the table his phone, on mute, notebooks, curriculum, pencils, and a glass of water. He turns on his laptop and connects, connects to Zoom. I hope my students are on time and know how to operate Zoom. Actually, I hope I can get through this without embarrassment. <laughs> Dr. Agu patiently waits for Zoom to open. The meeting starts in five seconds. He takes a drink from the glass of water. He can see as the students are waiting to connect to the meeting. He signs in as host. He struggles with the setting up the meeting, then begins the session. Students appear on his computer screen. Hello. I hope you are fine in spite of the pandemic. I see some of you are wearing masks. No need, but it's good practice. But for our meetings, let's show our smiling faces. More students appear on his computer screen. Some starting to remove their mask. I am your history professor, Dr. Agu, and actually broadcasting from Ghana. <laughs> I love the history of Africa and learning about my ancestors. So I flew to Africa to trace my family's origin and due to COVID-19 and the closures of airports in the United States, I am still here. Take a look in your chat. Take a look in your chat. I have included curriculum for today's lecture on Kwanzaa. It sounds interesting, but um, it would have been helpful if we had received your curriculum before the Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, Emily, Emily. <laughs> It was not planned for me to stay in Africa. Sometimes the best laid plans never happen. Let's get started. Okay. Um, the culture of African-American heritage is not just about slavery. Those of African descent hold in great esteem and pride the continent of Africa in a way to bridge the cultural gap between Africans and Americans, a prominent black man, Dr. Balana Karinga, created Kwanzaa after the uh, Watts riots in 1965. He identified seven principles of Kwanzaa to be practiced for seven days after Christmas Day. Unity is celebrated the first day, which I will lecture on now, following by self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and ending with faith. You're here to teach us American history. Kwanzaa is a man-made African celebration. What's in it for us, people like me? It's always about the black man, their needs, their demands, blah, blah, blah. Mouse, Mouse, it seems that you forget that African, black, black Africans were forcefully uprooted from their motherland to live as slaves in a foreign nation. Our culture was destroyed. 
Dr. Karenga created Kwanzaa as something for us. That's American history. What's the problem? Typical statement from a racist. Are you calling me a racist? What should I call you, a civil rights activist? <laughs> I come from a long line of patriots. <laughs> patriots? <laughs> More like bigots, racists, and Klansmen. We're getting off the topic of Kwanzaa. What I am is an educated white man who knows that if the black man behaved himself, there would be a perfect world order. <laughs> wow. Miles, Somebody you, mute him. Miles, you are out of control. We need to unite and protect our culture from vanishing. The protection of our culture was illustrated in global protests where not only African Americans participated, but other races who demonstrated unity and allyship in the aftermath of George Floyd's horrific death. Unity is the key that provides the glue to solve issues that Blacks throughout the world face. Where there is unity, there is love, fairness, understanding, and justice. If they didn't all differentiate themselves by holding holidays like Kwanzaa, then maybe things would be a little different. <laughs> See, I hate to say this, Miles, but <laughs> you need to understand what the Africans and African Americans have been through. <laughs> Blacks have had to struggle for their civil and human rights throughout the history of the United States. Okay, in Africa, it was their equal rights. If the white man didn't treat the Africans and the African Americans so inhumanely, there wouldn't be a cause for action. I'm sure you've heard of Apartheid in the civil rights movement. <laughs> Miles and Ace, we will have differences, but this but is a lecture, not a debate. The purpose of Kwanzaa was to bring peace, harmony, cultural understanding. Let's focus, people. Miles and his sympathizers are aware of the treatment of Africans, African Americans, and Blacks of other nations. Culture is what we have to hold on to in times of adversity. Yes, we do differentiate ourselves. It is inherent in our African heritage. There's people like you who are ignorant or refuse to recognize that Africans, African Americans, and Blacks are equal to all men. If it wasn't for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., do you think that black men would have their civil rights? If Nelson Mandela did not stand up for the rights of black South Africans, do you think they would have equal rights? No, they would still be slaves, subservient to the white men. The black man is a smart or smarter than most white men. They're inventors and innovators. Power and money are what the white man has and uses to keep the black man down. The perception from the media that black people are dangerous also adds to the confusion. As, as a white woman, I understand your concerns. And although I have black friends, I am cautious when walking alone and I see a black man approaching me. We're getting off track from my lecture on Kwanzaa. I, I understand the perspective of both my white and black students and it's time to be open to the truth. As a white woman, I am so sorry for Miles' behavior. Don't apologize for him. He's acting like his people. Yeah, that's right. Don't excuse him. Miles, stop living in the Jim Crow era. You're just a couple of whites who befriended blacks because you're too weak to stand up for what's right in society. Okay, class. I let you vent, but this is about a week of celebration. But to put things in context, if Africans or African-Americans were wrong, why was there so much unity between nations of all races to enforce equality and civil rights for Blacks? I just don't understand why Blacks are at the top of this list for injustice and brutality. That's a great statement, Ace, and we will revisit that. In the meantime, I think we all need to trace our roots like I did then we can understand and possibly be surprised who our ancestors might be. That's right. Miles might even have black ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well. <laughs> and the lights go down.
Wouldn't that be something if Miles did an ancestry DNA? <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's some kind of class that at this time, what we're going through right now, man, that's exactly what classrooms are, right? Just everybody all over everywhere and everybody has their opinions. So that was quite yeah, a discussion. It's a good thing too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was quite a discussion. And, you know, in, in something like that, it also shows how important it is, and this is a little bit off track, that when you're on, when your camera is on, people can actually see what you're doing. <laughs> so swiveling around in a chair, rolling your eyes, and people can actually see that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this one uh, <laughs> was just a reminder of a note to share that. So um, getting into, now that was play number... Four. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we're going to jump into number five, A Very Kwanzaa Christmas. A Very Kwanzaa Christmas. Imagination, people, especially in this one, because we're going to the carnival. The Kwanzaa ride is a reoccurring dream that Horace's daughter, Sierra, has been having for years, even before the Upshores started celebrating Kwanzaa maybe even the impetus, the impetus. There are certain things Horace is keeping hidden in his past from even his own family. For instance, in addition to being a day trader, he has a family history of slave trading back in the day. Even though he, it wasn't him doing the trading, he carries the weight of it and wants to make up for the damage his family has caused to the black community. He found out his unfortunate history while dating Cherie, and it is partly what caused the breakup. He never told her. Horace thinks by doing good deeds, he can somehow erase the past or at least make the dreams go away. Cherie has slave trading in her family history too, but in an unlikely part of her tree. Her family never discussed it. It is assumed, being African-American and with the mixing of races, that there may be some surprises in your family tree. A very Kwanzaa Christmas. Act one. Mother, father, and daughter are at a carnival and see the Kwanzaa ride. <gasps> Look, honey, let's go on the Kwanzaa ride. Are you kidding? We're supposed to be having fun. Be like that, sweetie. You don't know, you might like it. It's not enough that we need to celebrate it every year. We gotta now ride a Kwanzaa ride too. Do it for me, sweetheart. All right. Our family queues up. They see people coming out of the ride with varying responses and reactions. One person is nauseous and fights vomiting. One person is quite shook. Ooh, okay. Now that's what I'm talking about. Our family is at the front and the car comes. They all fit in the front seat. The car and he speaks to the others in line. Anyone want to fill the back seat? No, go on, take that one. We'll get the next one. And they're off. The ride starts with a jerk, slowly turning the corner in the dark they see an illuminated Umoja sign with unity in parentheses. But what is depicted is anything but unifying. We hear animal sounds like we are in a safari. We see what looks like an African family giving away one of their own to a white man. By the look on the family member's face, they don't want to go. The car continues jerking around another corner lights up on the family member trying to escape the white man. The family members are no longer around. There is an illuminated sign, Kuchi Chakulia, self-determination. Suddenly, the frozen escaping family member jumps into the car with our family. They are in the back seat crouching, hiding from the white man. Our family screams, not expecting what just occurred. The car is now going up a steep incline, slowly jerking up and up 
with signs on either side. They approach one of the signs on the right that says, Ujima, Collective Work and Responsibility. There is only a mirror as an exhibit. Our family sees themselves and the new family member in the back. They continue up the incline. On the left, there is Ujama, Cooperative Economics. We see a city with the name Watts in front of it on fire or on Black Wall Street. The car continues to a plateau. The jerking eases a bit and we see a field of wheat. There is a very pleasant light breeze. We hear birds chirping and see a rainbow in the distance. The escape family member immediately jumps out and we see the sign Nia, purpose. The family member waves goodbye to our family. The car continues up this level plateau. We turn a corner and the car stops suddenly. The car is now surrounded by walls. The wall starts spinning, or is it the car? It is now pitch black. We see the word kumba, creativity projected on the walls. We see traditional African hairstyles. Then we see them on white people. We see black musicians in black and white. We then see Elvis Presley and other white musicians. We see pictures of slaves teaching their masters, showing them how to do things. Then we see the pictures of those same masters, prosperous, surrounded by people while the slave is alone and in a shack. Just when our family can't take the spinning anymore, the car stops, the wall stops spinning, the door raises and the car continues. This looks to be the end of the ride when we pass a sign that says, Imani, faith. We see the escaped family member who is now looking at our family as they pass. Blackout. Lights up on Sierra and her father, Horace, in her bedroom. Dad, I had that dream again. The Kwanzaa ride? Yeah. <laughs> Must be that time of year again. I guess, but it's really disturbing. I can imagine. Wish I knew how to make it stop. Believe me, if I could take it from you, I would. Thanks, Dad. Of course. So what are you going to get mom this year? I don't know. What do you think I should get her? I don't think you can top last year. That dashiki mm -hmm. was absolutely beautiful. Really brought out her eyes. See, your old man still has it. <laughs> what are you going to get mom? She's been talking about getting her hair braided. I know someone who does a really beautiful job. Oh, that sounds like a winner. <laughs> it's great to have you home, Sierra, even if it is under these circumstances. Yeah, it's too bad that it just stopped being safe at school. Crazy times. I better get going. Don't want to be late for work. Have a great day, Dad. Love you, sweetheart. Love you too, Dad. We hear the front door close. Lavania comes in Sierra's bedroom. Um, what are we going to do? About this being that time of year again? Yeah, I thought it would be different when I came home this time. I don't know what to do, but your father is really determined to celebrate Kwanzaa every year. Yeah, he does know we're not black, right? Yep, and he knows you don't have to be Mexican to celebrate oh, no. I, Still, does he really expect you to be walking around with that dashiki? With my hair braided? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love your father, but I think he takes this whole walking a mile in another person's shoes a little too far. Oh, but at least his heart's in the right place. Yeah, but do we have to say the African pledge this year? I mean, come on. You do have to admit the seven principles are pretty powerful. Yeah, so powerful. I dream about them every year in this house. Again? Like clockwork. The Kwanzaa ride? None other. 
And with the same family? Yep. Huh. Maybe the ancestors are trying to tell us something. Blackout. Act one, scene two. Lights up on Cherie and Cecil in a field of wheat in August. Oh boy, it's hot. Yeah, it's August. Oh, I know. It's supposed to be hot. I got it. Because if it was, let's say, March, well, of course. It... What I, when I said I got it, what part of that didn't you get? I thought you were talking about the postcard. Well, we already talked about that. Why would I need to tell you again that if I got it, that I got it, if we already talked about it, and you know I got it? This heat must be getting to me. Yeah, it's hot. Oof. Yeah, it's August. Oof. That's all you got? I tried to tell you about March, but you didn't want to hear it. No, I mean, don't you care about the postcard? No. I trust you. You said it was over and I believe you. Then why would he send me a postcard? That doesn't make you want answers? No. I trust you. But I mean, people don't just send people postcards out of the blue. Well, you said he did. I know what I said. What? It's hot. There you go changing the subject. Well, maybe what, maybe you can tell me why you found it necessary to bring me to a field of wheat. But in August, the in this heat, I'm trying to tell you. Okay, I'm listening. It has to do with the postcard. Okay. This is now ours. This field of wheat. Yeah. He's giving it to me. What? <laughs> Reparations. Reparations? You know, the making of an amends when you have wronged someone. I know what it means. But dang, that must have been some breakup. Yeah, on top of what his ancestors done. Wait, you never told me he was white. Sure I did. No, no, I would have remembered that slight detail. Okay, so there you have it. And here we are. Here we are. Wheat. <laughs> hey, I know it's no 40 acres and a mule, but. <laughs> and the lights fade. So as you had shared, Ben, you know, it's all about the, it's, it's a creative process. And right now it's just, we're just getting a taste of the story and the characters and to see if it's something that we at the Roby Theater Company would like to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's and what it's about. I, I like the idea, frankly, and I think everybody here, because most of the people here, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with most of them, and most of them are artists and go yeah. through this process. So they know what's going on. And they know what's going on and we're all creatives. So we're gonna jump into our next one. Our next one, number six is called The Girls. Now, The Girls is a melodrama that showcases the lives of four women, one Asian, one black, one Latina, and one white. Fast friends since college, Sasha has invited the three women to celebrate the Kwanzaa feast with her. And so her five-year-old son, John, would have play dates. Now her husband would host big Kwanzaa feasts with family and friends and Sasha never invited her friends as they'd fallen out years ago. This year they'll spend time catching up and celebrating milestones like one's college graduation, another's re-entry into society from prison, etc. Their children spend this time of celebration playing together throughout the home as children do. The women reminisce, argue, fuss, celebrate, cajole, laugh, go through all the emotions that a long-standing friendship would experience in a reunion type atmosphere. These women are ride or die. They go to hell and back for each other. But things go awry when one of the sons is shot by one of the women. The Girls, a stage play. Scene one, 
before the rise, a gunshot. At rise, four women across the stage run. Scene two. At rise, Humphrey home, upper class furnishings, the seventh day of Kwanzaa, Imani, January 1, early afternoon. Kwanzaa decorations are throughout the home. A little boy shouts from another room, Mommy, Mommy, they're here, they're here. Hold on, stop running. They're here, Mommy, come on, come on, come on, come on. The doorbell rings, the maid comes out of the kitchen. I'll get it, Leslie. Don't open the door, John. John, you don't open the door. I hurry, got it. Mommy, hurry, hurry. They Mom. won't leave. They're here to play, I promise. Stand here, now. And Sasha opens the door to Annabelle and Stephen. John leads Stephen through the front rooms to the kitchen. Annabelle and Sasha fall into an embrace. Oh, it's been too long. Too long. Thank you for inviting us over. I couldn't let another year go by without seeing each other. Come, sit. Oh, oh, John has gotten so big. I can't believe they are five. Five. Wow. Five long years. years. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully Michi and Tiffany don't. They have kids now. They won't fight. They both have what they've always wanted. You keeping tabs on everyone? Of course. If I didn't, who would? You never call anyone anyway. I've always been the glue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever. I've just been busy. Busy my ass. You didn't want to choose between Tiffany and Miche. <laughs> didn't want to choose. I didn't have to choose. They ignore me. Don't call. Don't write. Don't like my post. Your post? You stalking them? <laughs> no. I just so happen to, you know. <laughs> Noda said they don't like your post. What's up? <laughs> anyway, I invited them today. To ask them about your post. No. Just like you said, it's been too long. Mm -hmm. We need to get over ourselves and rekindle what we had. You sentimental. Mm. No. I mean, Jonathan, I need, you guys are my girls. We, we've been through and we said forever. That we did. But Amisha and Tiff. When the doorbell rings, Sasha turns to open the door for Misha, Tyler, Tiffany, and Keith. Hi, girls. What's up? Misha, <laughs> Tiffany, so glad to see you. Tyler, Keith, follow me. Follow my son. Um, he'll take you to where the play area is. Play area? Shame. Uh, go on, Keith. Go play with the boys. We'll be right here. Keith and Tyler reluctantly go into the kitchen with John and Stephen. I wouldn't miss this. Look at here. Nice big oversized living room. Hey, quit it. What? I'm just complimenting Sasha on her great taste. Are we getting the grand tour? Don't you start. Come over here and have some of this. You guys hear this? Sorry. Don't you start. Come over here and have some of this crudite. What? I just want a tour. Big house and all. I know that she wants to show us around. Later. I'm sure you'll get a tour later, right, Sasha? Yes, ma'am. The grand tour on me. Uh, Tiffany, would you like a glass of wine? <clears throat> Maybe something else. Do you, do you have a sparkling water? Or it's sparkling cider. Oh, no, never mind. Water will do. <clears throat> There's a bottle here. Okay, we'll bring it to you. Miche, take the charcuterie and crudite over to the couch. Miche takes the platter to the coffee table. Annabelle follows. Tiffany has taken off her shoes, tucking her feet under herself. Well, this is a nice, cozy home. Jonathan won at his house. I'm sorry. Why? Did you kill him? Hey, stop. What? No need to apologize. I was just... Thanks. I didn't mean to bring up bad memories. Nothing bad. He was the love of my life. 
I'll never marry again. I've trained one man and I don't want to train another. Seriously. In all seriousness, yes. I don't want to marry again. I'm fine being by myself, taking care of myself, choosing when I can sleep and when I can awake and when I can leave and when I can stay. It's hard being a wife, but I was willing to be that for Jonathan. But I'm done. Just mommy for John. Wow, Don, you. I never even started. What happened to Ryan? Left me six months ago, cold, stranded, and with a baby to boot. He hung in there for a while, right? Oh, yeah, four years. I hope he'll stay in Keith's life. Is he even Keith's daddy? Me, Shay, stop. What? Not today. We here. Let's be good. I'm always good. Really? Sasha, give us the tour. Um, okay. Well, let's start where the boys are. Okay, come. come. And Sasha leads the ladies out of the room into the kitchen as the lights fade. I have a group of girls, seven of them from college, and we are true ride or die. So that is so relatable on so many levels. <laughs> Every woman can relate to that, I'm telling you, Ben. <laughs> the fuse is lit, isn't it? I mean, it seems like the fuse was lit five years ago and it never went out. Here's it five years later, and there are uh, still uh, disagreements. And Still kind of dealing with it. it it's going to need to, sometimes things have to have some time to let it lie down and then it'll come all out. So it's going to be interesting to see how Kwanzaa plays into that. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, yeah. our yeah. final, we have the final play is speaking of how Kwanzaa plays into that. Our final play is named Saving Kwanzaa. And mm -hmm. Saving Kwanzaa, I'm going to let you read the synopsis for that, Ben. Thank you, ma'am. And this is number seven. It, this is our final one, number seven. So please keep the comments coming, and we're going to go right into Saving Kwanzaa. Take it away, Ben. Lumira Lamour, known to her family and friends as Lumi, is not in the Christmas spirit. A Black woman of Haitian descent, she has been focused on, focused on her career and rarely has time for anything else. A child of Haitian immigrants, her family used to celebrate Christmas by going to midnight mass and exchanging gifts on Christmas Day. After her father died a few years ago, Lumi threw herself even deeper into her work. Lumi's star has been on the rise in her real estate firm, Davenport and Company. Recently, her firm landed a deal with the prestigious development company, Riser Development Corporation. They are looking to redevelop an area of the community in Spring Valley, New York that has been struggling for years. The development company has promised that they can revitalize the area, bring jobs and raise the profile of the neighborhood. At the heart of the neighborhood is the Circle of Culture Center. Sean McKenzie runs the center. The holiday season, the McKenzie's find themselves in a battle to save the center. Lumi and Sean's world collide when she is forced to spend time at the center. At the last minute, with all options lost to save the center, Lumi discovers that the building the center is housed in is actually almost 100 years old, which qualifies it to be designated a historic site in the community. The play ends with on January 1, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa celebration with a twist, a tribute to Haitian independence. Saving Kwanzaa. Lumi, a black woman, is folding and stuffing flyers with Sean who runs the Circle Community Center. How have you lived all this time and not known what Kwanzaa is? <laughs> How important it is to this community? My dad was right. You need to give back your black card right now. Whatever. 
look, we didn't celebrate Kwanzaa in my family. Growing up Haitian, I didn't even know what Kwanzaa existed until I got to college. Just like a lot of other American things, like pasta sauce. Pasta sauce, really? What did you put on pasta? Ketchup. Oh God, you're killing me. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, but really, it was just different. In all these past years, I haven't really been around my family as much. Work keeps me busy. That the only reason? My dad passed away a few years ago. You know, he loved the holidays. He used to always do it up. The trees, presents, everything. Midnight mass, that was his favorite. Since he's been gone, it just hasn't been the same. I just can't even bring myself to think about going. I don't even know why I'm telling you this. Sorry to hear about your dad. But the holidays, I mean, that's a time for family. Haven't they missed you? Haven't you missed them? Yeah, of course. It's just been hard. Besides, like I said, work keeps me busy. Yeah. Your work to entirely change this neighborhood. Hey, that's not fair. It's just business. Just business? This is not just business, Lumi. This is life. People's lives. My pops put all his life into this center, to this community, and now you're just going to come up in here and just... Not me, the company I work for. You think that separates you from what's happening here? It doesn't, Lumi. As much as I'm a part of this center, you're a part of your company. And that's how the community is going to see it, too. I mean, the center has been a part of every good thing about this neighborhood. For some people, it's like family. What you're doing is going to destroy all that. Don't you think that's a little extreme? Look around, Sean. This neighborhood hasn't been thriving for some time now. Don't you want to see it improve? If you drive down Evan Street, you'll find at least 10 empty storefronts. These could be businesses that are employing people that are bringing dollars into the neighborhood. Why do people think that's such a bad thing? You're missing the point. Getting the community back on its feet is not a bad thing. Erasing the whole essence of who we are? That is the bad thing. Getting rid of the center means that there will be no gathering place for people, no place for people to bring their kids to learn about art, history, and culture. No place for elders to come together to reminisce about the past. And no place for the final Kwanzaa celebration. What's so special about Kwanzaa anyway? I mean, it's not like it's an official American holiday or anything. Just because white America doesn't celebrate it doesn't mean it isn't important. White America doesn't celebrate Haitian independence, does it? But you all treat it like a holiday. Yeah, but that's the holiday of an official country. Okay, your point is? See? You've been so wrapped up in yourself that you don't even understand why this relates to you, too. The seven principles of Kwanzaa connect us back to Africa. We might have all ended up in different places, right? But we all came from the same continent. And that desire to keep us connected to it, that's what this is all about. I haven't thought about it that way. Well, more like than you think, Lumi. <laughs> I don't know what it is about you. My rational mind is telling me that you're the enemy, but I can't even believe I'm sitting here with you working on the Kwanzaa event when you are the very person trying to shut us down. You keep saying that like it's my decision. I'm just doing my job. Just doing your job? You know, for someone who is the daughter of the Haitian Revolution, you sure don't understand what they fought for. What are you talking about? I don't know too much about the Haitian Revolution, but it seems to me like those enslaved Africans were not about to let white folks colonize their land. And that's exactly what you're letting your boss do to us. You know what? You have no idea what, I'm, what I have to deal with, what I'm trying to do. No, what I have to do. This center is your, is your life. Well have, well, have you ever stopped to think that my work is my life? That I pride myself at being good at it? And that maybe, just maybe, there's a bigger, 
thing at stake here. Why am I even telling you this? It won't matter. You've already made up your mind about who I am. So how about this? I will continue to help you because my sister needs me to help, but I will stay out of your way. And I hope you'll stay out of mine. I'm not asking for all that. Numi, don't you see? You have the power to change things here. Why aren't you willing to do that? This isn't some kind of game, Sean. Now, I'm sorry that you may lose the center. I really am. But I don't see that there's much I can do about that. I can help you with the celebration, but that's all that's within my power. The sooner you come to terms with that, the better it will be for all of us. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry too. You know what? Hold up a minute. What? Don't go anywhere. Sean goes off and comes back with a large box. Here. Take this. What is this, a bribe? <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> no. <laughs> Open it. <laughs> Damn. Are all Haitian women this stubborn? Just open it. Please. Lumi opens the box, and inside there is a large carved canara with candles. We got some extras if we collect it over the years and we give them to community members who don't have them. You can have that one. Since we won't be needing it anymore. I can't take this. Really, it's too much. Sean steps in closer to Lumi and puts his hands over hers, closing the box. Take it. Happy Kwanzaa. Thank you. Lumi goes, but not before, turning and giving a final look at Sean. And she walks off and the lights go down. Well, those are our seven. And so now, thank you for everyone who gave their time and their talent to participating in our virtual event. So now we'd like to invite everyone to comment in the comment in the chat um, and just put, I have a question or a comment as Crystal has already noted. And we, we value your input. As we said earlier, this is a community discussion and whatever is chosen will be presented next, uh, well, actually this year now. So just for ease of reference, I'll go through them number one through seven. So number one, was Habari K. What? Number two, you will see me. Number three was the untitled Kwanzaa play. Number four was a celebration of unity, Kwanzaa story. Number five, a very Kwanzaa Christmas. Number six, the girls. And number seven, saving Kwanzaa. So those are the seven, you don't have to remember the name, just if you just go through one through seven. And as I said, please, you're welcome to put into the comments. Um, and actually, if you'd have a live comment, you are welcome to share that as well. Ben, did you have any comments to share? Well, uh, not really, no, you know, again, uh, even though mm, I think just about all the scenes played fine individually without the actual entire story behind it, it was uh, it, it was almost complete in a in a sense. 
Yeah, and, and that is in a tribute to the actors. Uh, they bring a whole nother layer of language to it, life to it, of course. Hey, Stevie Mac, I see you over there. It's good to see you again. A lot of familiar faces. Definitely a lot of familiar faces. And again, thank you everyone for, we're taking your comments to heart. And again, this is the Ruby Theater Company. We're a community theater, we're a nonprofit. So please go to our website. And if you're able to, then please make a donation and also share it with others because we are able to survive because of your support. Thank you so much for what you do with us. Not for us, with us because we are a community and we are the Roby Theater Company family. Good. I see Mel Hampton over there, that's good. Somebody in there, hey, Mel, there's a lot of familiar faces, some pictures, there's Bill. Oh, someone's offering to volunteer. That's William, I think, oh, he's waving. <laughs> Does Sati Barak want to talk? Now, does anyone have any actual questions? Yeah. I would like to volunteer. Okay, here we are, Ben. We have a volunteer. So let's, uh, let's see if we can get the sound up a little bit. If you would, if you would kindly just put your name and email in the chat someone will be able to write it down and reach out to you because we love help <laughs> or if you unmute your microphone you can just speak up if you want to unmute your microphone somebody wanted to say something i hear somebody talking yeah stevie said he has a comment stevie mac do you have a comment uh, yes, this was a very great presentation today. And uh, for me, what stood out most is a play that uh, shows the prejudices that one has against different culture and something that they feel that threatens what they already believe in. Somebody's, uh, somebody's TV is loud. Uh, uh, mute yourself because your TV is talking over me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, a play that... Uh, shows the struggle that people have with the acceptance of learning about Kwanzaa. I mean, because when we did the Kwanzaa celebration here, um, I didn't know much about it. I knew of it, but I didn't know all the details. And now that I know all the details, I have a much more better appreciation, but I could imagine somebody who feels like it's threatening Christmas. Oh, you don't want us to celebrate Christmas now, huh? Because of this Kwanzaa thing or Maulana Karanga is this and that, right? So people have all those different prejudices. And so a play that addresses all that would help people who feel like that to understand. But the, then again, each of these plays tonight um, had a different angle on it. So that's my, which was good. So that I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, coming at it from a different place, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Stevie, for that comment. It, you're absolutely right. They're all from different aspects of life that we can all relate to, whether it's the classroom, whether it's having girlfriends, whether it's people coming over. It's just all, and that's what we are as a theater company. We, we life imitating art, imitating life. That's what it's about. Now, I know uh, Theo Don Brown had a comment. Theo Don, are you still here? Guess not. Guess not. Mel Hampton is raising his hand. Okay, go ahead, Mel. You're muted, Mel. Okay, Sydney Wayne Davis has a comment. Sydney, come on in. Happy Kwanzaa, everyone. <laughs> And all the playwrights, all the actors, and just to the Roby. Um, I, I really enjoyed them all. I think the one that stuck out, I believe it was number three, um, because it had the argument with the, the young son being knowledgeable about Kwanzaa and the father, you know, having so much religious knowledge 
And I really like that dynamic because I think that's so much a part of <laughs> just black America. And that that argument is very real in families. There are some people that I'm a devout Christian myself, but I celebrate Kwanzaa too. I love the principles, but there are a lot of Christians that look at that like, what? <laughs> and so I think that that dynamic of the family, the inner argument, I think as Ben would say, dramatically interesting, you know, and uh, I think that um, I don't know where that play is going to go, but I think it's off already off to a great start, great characters. And I, I, that really drew me in. It's very real life. Now you said Sydney was now which one you said that was number three. I think it was number three with Elizabeth June. And I think it was number three. I think it's untitled. Is that the one? Yes. Untitled Kwanzaa play. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I like that dynamic uh, dealing with celebrating the principles of Kwanzaa and knowing the history of it, and then also having somebody who is a staunch church follower and debate that debate with the scriptures and the number seven means this in the Bible. But, you know, so I think that that is a real conversation that um, is already happening in African-American homes. And so I think a play about that I think could draw us together, could bring some unity because nothing else will have the conversation, you know. So I like where it, it, it kind of took me. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your comment. That's, that's very true because there are mind. a lot of misconceptions about it. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's so true. Yeah. Does someone else have a comment? Yeah, I do. I got my mic on. Can you hear me now? Is yes, we can hear you. I think Thanks, it was, Mel. I think it was good. Um, and because virtual is a new medium. So the energy level that you have in virtual, just like the energy level between stage and film is different. And as an actor, you have to realize that, that you raise your energy when it's virtual, but you can't move around because the Zoom camera, it becomes blurry to the audience, especially the bigger the room you have. So it's important as actors that like when Ben directs you to do your character, to hit that energy level precisely so that your audience, because there's that gap, there's that lag between the time it leaves you until your audience member sees it. And unfortunately, that lag, it makes everybody kind of sound the same. So it's very important that when the actor is directed to hit that one level for his character, to stay there mm -hmm. and not move too much mm -hmm. because it becomes blurry. But I think it's all three, all the plays have a great start. Um, I like number three when grandma came because she picked up the energy and ran with it. It was really, really good. I enjoyed it. So I think they all have um, great potential to be developed. But as actors, the more we, we practice on this Zoom media, the more precise we become. Like when Stevie Mac is performing, every movement that he does, you see it because he's got his virtual timing down. And that's, that's a thing that we have to work on because, you know, some stage actors can't do film and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I want to audition for Othello. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> Those are great points. Okay, we can talk about that one. We can talk about that one, sure. Othello okay. on a bike. <laughs> oh, we didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for your comments, Mel. That is so true. Thank you. Now, auditioning for Othello, that's Ben's department. You can throw it out there. We're gonna one. push that away. Uh, no, it's not time yet. Okay. But we do appreciate your comments about the plays. Thank you so much. Did anyone else have a question or a comment before we close out this evening? Thank you, Eve Summers. Eve likes all of them. Thank you. Anyone else have any final comments? Listen, there's something that Eve, is Eve still with us? Is she here? Or did she, did she leave? Eve may have left. I have a comment from Crystal now, and she's saying that lots of comments in chat, but no voices. So that's okay. As long as it's there, we can see it. It's fine. Eve is still there, actually. I see her. 
Why don't you say what you what you wrote, Eve, because it's important and and good. Please. No. Yeah, I can. My my camera doesn't work. Um, well, we can, I said I we said two you. things. One of them was, you know, one of the things that really struck me was how the chat really blew up. I don't know if everybody was reading it, but the comments about Miles. Um, so obviously it, it hit a nerve, um, but it seems like the focus is more on having African Americans understand why Kwanzaa is necessary and who really who cares what white people think. But, um, but at the same time, um, I used to sponsor the Black Student Union and we would always have a Kwanzaa display in the classroom and the students would, you know, would look into it and most of them by their teenage years had never participated in Kwanzaa or been involved in it. But I think for some of them it did plant a seed and maybe as they have children, they, you know, they, they are participating. It's a really a beautiful celebration. So I hope they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a beautiful celebration. And a, a, a slow start. I, I frankly don't know an awful lot of people who celebrate Kwanzaa, or at least in a very public way, celebrate Kwanzaa. Mel, go ahead. Over in Lemert Park, um, they have a lot of... Um, local Kwanzaa celebrations because, you know, James Burke's is Marla's old place is now the Vision Theater. Mm. So they have a lot of uh, Afrocentric things that are going on in that neighborhood. Did you ever think about if you reached out to the guy who still teaches at Long Beach State who started Kwanzaa, maybe next year to join your celebration, he might be able to, because, you know, he's also has a, a drum group and they teach African dance lessons here at the center here in Long Beach. I don't know if you know that the professor. I don't know him, but I now that you mention it, and he's that close, I didn't know he was that close. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. he'd really be a part of this. I mean, it's important that he'd be a part of this. The whole idea, you know, I mean, I, I this is not a news bulletin, but the whole idea of custom and culture is so important to sustain. And there's no reason why they both can't happen, because after all, African-American, right? Christmas. Yeah. Uh, Kwanzaa, Christmas, I mean, it's, it becomes a kind of extension. And uh, for many of us, a dominant factor, a way to do things differently, not just because they're different, but because it's a different spirit in many ways, you know, we have that. It's just part of us, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. And I think you're right about, I had more people that were not black wish me happy Kwanzaa than the black people. Even during this pandemic, I still get out and about and, you know, and audition and stuff. But yeah, I think you're right. I don't know if it's because we want to hold on to those old Christmas values. Like the one play where they was talking about comparing Kwanzaa to Christmas. Was that number two? Mm. There was a couple of places. And I but, think it's very, that's that very was number viable. three. Yeah. Because even in some households, you know, my daughter teaches African-American studies, but even in their world of African-American studies, there's some of the professors that don't really celebrate it because the guy who started at Long Beach State disagrees with the principals. And I'm like, but wait a minute, you guys are teaching the youth on the master's and on the, on the PhD level. Shouldn't there be more community between you two but there isn't and they teach african-american studies what 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 was that about disagreeing the some public? of the african-american professors don't agree with him in the core values of kwanzaa the meanings of each day some of them i guess when he was doing his research he wanted to put, some of them wanted to put other values on day like three and other values on day like seven, but he held to his, his, his outline and it was approved. So some of them don't like that. So that's why they don't celebrate even in their classrooms and they're teaching African-American studies. Oh, it's hard to get away from mainstream sometimes, you know. Isn't it? 
you know, we get, we grow up, we grow up with a lot of that and are inundated with that and sometimes even brainwashed with mainstream values, yeah. ideas, visions. And even though they go very far away from our soul at times and uh, difficult to shake it sometimes. Mm -hmm. and you know, Jesus had, Jesus had 24 disciples and wound up with 12. <laughs> Disagreements, huh? <laughs> yeah. You can't please all of the people all of the all time. All the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never. Yeah. Do people in, I'm going to ask my daughter because her fiance is from Ghana. I'll ask her tomorrow. Do people in Ghana celebrate Kwanzaa? That's of course, I might know that. She has well, it. I can answer that. Yeah. No, they're Christians. They've been colonized. Yep. Wow. It's an African American holiday. And it's celebrated largely by activists when it started early in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I, and no one, everyone I know celebrates Kwanzaa, but they all were activists way back in the day. So I think the foundation is political in terms of us um, accepting our African heritage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just, you know, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm commending uh, Ben for tackling this and having Kwanzaa recognition. It's needed in the mainstream because I am isolated with people who are outside the mainstream, uh, political people who were involved in the struggle on the picket lines came from that era where we needed to recognize our African heritage. And so it's uh, new to most people who are outside that realm, who didn't participate in, like Nelson Mandela. I remember all of that time when we tried to get the apartheid ended. It was very, very political. And a lot of people did not step out onto that platform. Now, civil rights is a different story. It's a little less controversial, I guess. I don't know how to put that, but trust me, you're on the right path, Ben. It's you know, what you, just, what you just broke down, Acosta, is, is really food and fodder for a dramatic story. The whole idea of those who were probably in a militant resistance mindset mm -hmm. back in the day and presently, are more susceptible to appreciate and celebrate Kwanzaa. Correct. Some because some people call it radical. Well, it, most it things was that, back in my day. <laughs> it was the a college back. student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I? I wasn't going to say anything, but I was in college from 1970 to 1973. And so I came up in that era. And it was a time that we, as Black students, we had to separate ourselves in order to survive. Because by separating ourselves, we formed unity. And so whatever we could do to promote that unity for ourselves in the midst of a white campus, which was California, State University at Northridge, but back then it was it was it wasn't even a university. Mm -hmm. And we did that, be it the Black Student Union, Pan African Studies Department, Black Panthers, Kwanzaa celebrations. We had a black house on campus. Red, black, and green was our whole life. And this is what we did to survive and to promote unity for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know. That was what, I mean, when you say radical, well, yeah, but we did it to survive. We, we needed to get what was ours. And the only way we could do it was by sticking to mm -hmm. Because in those days, police were after us in the valley. They would take you underneath the 405 freeway, pull you out of a car, beat your ass, and then leave you there. Those, mm -hmm. those are the things that we went through that nobody really knows about. Those now, they're into sororities and fraternities. We didn't have any of that. We were trying to survive and 
and clear a path for the rest of them to come through. And so Kwanzaa, yeah, that came out of that and we celebrated it. We celebrated it because it was ours. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, well, it's, it's just emotional. You know, it, it gets past uh, the realm of what, entertainment or even education. You know, it, it just gets to a point where, you know, where when you speak about violence, people getting their ass beat. You know, that's this becomes, uh, yeah, life and death, as you say, to survive. Because, you know, that, that can be thrown around in a way that is uh, metaphorical, uh, talking about uh, just trying to live, trying to move forward, surviving. Uh, but with all the death that surround us, surrounds us all the time, I mean, George Floyd is only one of many, but he just popped out at that time and just the manner of his murder was so outrageous and so visible. You know, I mean, it's like the civil rights movement in Birmingham back in 63 when television cameras went there and saw all that was happening and that was spread all over the world, the water hoses, the dogs, uh, that, that sheriff, all of those, all of that was really visible. It wasn't just a news headline. It wasn't just even a photograph, but you could see that and see the hatred, the bloody hatred of it all. Yeah, and it, it, it actually- was a really emotional it, event, you know, in sense, and, and, and it's a, being theater artist and the kind of theater that we, were inspired to do, which is socially conscious theater, that is uh, really the food the kind of meat we live on. Yeah. Well, somebody uh, needs to hear that. And that's, a, that's even another angle. Well, who, who's trying to get in? It is. Well, Sandra Watkins has been had her hand up and she has been trying to make a comment and she'll be the last one. Mm. Sandra, are you still there? Please unmute your microphone. We'd love to hear your comment. Sandra? Well, I guess Sandra's not here anymore. Um, last person. But that's okay. Uh -huh. well, that's, that is Lorinda. Yeah, I just wanted to just quickly say that um, some people that I've known were turned off from Kwanzaa because of Dr. Ron's crime where he was um, violent against that woman. It's um, like he held her against her will. And so I don't know if that was before he created Kwanzaa or if that happened after he quit. But yeah, that what? was something that kept coming up um, that's actually personally what turned me off from Kwanzaa like years ago, but then with all the Black Lives Matter and actually because Ben brought up this subject, um, you know, I wanted to research the actual holiday and the principles separate from the creator. And it was like, what? These, these principles are what I'm about, you know? And this is what our community needs. And if it's about unifying our people more, how can you be against that? I mean, especially now when everything's been brought to light with George Floyd and police brutality, you can't turn your back to it. I mean, some people do, but no, I mean, I, I thank you, Ben, for bringing this up this subject of Kwanzaa to the forefront. Um, um, it's been a blessing to me personally. So I just want to thank you for that. Welcome. Lorenda, thank you for that comment because that that's so true that a lot of people do, you know, they compare or they put the person or the origins and make that about like, you know, Christmas was, and it was originally started as a pagan holiday is what some believe. So that means that <laughs> excuse me, that there, that because it started as one thing and that's where it stays. Whereas, you know, we, we all have flaws. If you go back to Christianity, we were all started from sin. 
So now just because way back then we our origin was from sin does not make mean that everything that we touch is is going to be horrible. So I think you make a really, really great point that, you know, a lot of people may may just, you know, think of that one and not consider what you just said. So thank you for sharing that. We've got a, a really exchange going on in chat. Um, there's pros and cons about Dr. Koenga. And that well, you know, that's that, you know, I think I like what you just, what you suggested. Maybe we need to have a conversation with Dr. Uh, Moringa and just- that's a, that's a whole nother play, right? <laughs> and, you know, get yeah. that out there. No, there's accusations about he was an FBI informant and, and uh, I, you know, again, it, the, these kinds of uh, statements, or do they open doors and say, and like, what the hell is that? What is that? An FBI informant, the guy who invented Kwanzaa. And but then when one thinks about it, Malcolm had a cop as one of his bodyguards at the Audubon Ballroom. There uh, in the Panthers was riddled with informants in its latter days. Just riddled with informants. And so things happen, people change. There's always a, a story though. There's always a some kind of, I'm not even gonna say explanation, but there's a story and there's the truth. What, exactly what really happens and all of what really happens because one statement does not give a full picture no it doesn't you always have three sides you have this side this side and then you have the truth <laughs> to every story mel hey unmute yourself mel One of the other ladies who teaches African-American studies said. You went back on mute, Mel. Somehow you, you, your uh, mic tripped back to mute. You're on mute. How am I now? You're good. She said her exact comments was, are you asking me why I don't do Kwanzaa? I love the principles. However, I can't disassociate the holiday from its creator. So they're, like the other ladies said, some of the ladies that know they that's the problem with celebrating it because of the gentleman who the creator of it. And can I just jump in again, just real quickly. Um, if we want criminal justice reform, which I mean, I am, a, I, I mean, we got to know that people can change and people can be rehabilitated. And I feel like there's more grace for some people than there are for other people. And um, I think that's just what helps me reconcile this. Cause I, I feel like, well, I don't wanna be a hypocrite myself trying to advocate for criminal justice reform, not to just lock people up and forget about them, but to know that people can be rehabilitated. You know, I can't speak that and then just be about like, no, I'm not gonna check out Kwanzaa because of the creator. Um, I, I think we need to have that discussion too. And I think it would help if we could talk to Dr. Karenga as well, because mm -hmm. yeah, just. All right, so, so uh, if you guys want to end on a lighter note, let me just tell you a quick joke. Joke, okay. Right, so okay, thanks Stevie. Preacher was out preaching to the crowd. He without sin throw the first stone. I said, he who was without sin, let him throw the first stone. A brick came from the back of the crowd. Bam! He said, who threw that brick? Oh, wino staggered to the front, said, me. He said, are you without sin? He said, sin? I thought you said gin. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> that is wonderful. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you for adding that comedy light to it. I appreciate you so much. And we appreciate all of you for participating in this afternoon's New Year's Day, final day of Kwanzaa virtual celebration. 
Thank you for all of your input. And I'll say it one more time. We could not do this without you. We are a community theater. You are our community. We all work together. Uh, we'd love it if you'd be able to go make a donation. Not going to beat you over the head with it, but we cannot go on without you and your help and support. So take care, everyone. My name is Melina Gay. It has been a pleasure to co-host this fabulous event this evening with the co-founder of the Roby Theater Company, Mr. Ben Guillory. We've appreciated your input. And we appreciate you. I'm going to say good evening. Ben, if you would like to have any final words. Well, it's just great, to see, floor. great to see everybody. First day of the year. It's going to be a great year. Economic opportunity